We're continuing our discussion on good mental health with our behavior expert and solutions focused life coach, Dr. Neil Marinello out of Woodstock, Vermont. I'm your host, Matt Kelly. We thank you for joining us today. Our topic for today's discussion is quality of life is the only variable that matters. And Neil, as I dive deep, deep into this topic, into the, the title, you know, this really feels like it's a no brainer, but of course it's not in the forefront of mine or anybody else's mind. And yet it is more than likely a determining factor of virtually everything that I and humans do. Yes, yes. And uh, as, uh, as I look at my tweets, I think that they basically are an attempt to figure out uh, exactly uh, who I am and what I do. And, uh, uh, the process of defining uh, what I actually do, I've, I've worked out several different ways of describing it, uh, but I guess that uh, uh, with regard to quality of life, I think the, uh, uh, the good daddy uh, is the one that we began with. Uh, the, uh, the thing that I think applies most to this particular subject is the concept of me being a professional friend. Uh, professional, I would define as any area of expertise in which one is better now than one was a month ago, uh, will be better a month from now than one is now, and uh, uh, will never be perfect. Uh, I, uh, the friend aspect, uh, a, a friend is also somebody who uh, advises you in terms of what uh, he or she thinks is best for you, regardless of whether you like it or not. Uh, the professional aspect also includes getting paid, which happens sometimes for me. Uh, the quality aspect, I think, uh, I tend to relate to, to two things about that. Uh, one is... Uh, uh, a couple of books came out in the 70s. One is called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I remember. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Good. And uh, uh, the concept in that is that uh, uh, you find something to focus on uh, that uh, is an area that you want to improve your expertise in. It's just one area, and you keep working on it, and you keep working on getting better at it. Uh, there are all kinds of areas that one decides not to be an expert at or that one couldn't be an expert at even if one tried. Uh, but Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance uh, tends to talk about um, pick up one particular area that you really want to work on and become better at. Mm -hmm. uh, the other book I thought of was a book called uh, uh, Sibumi, which was written by someone called Trevanian, which is a uh, uh, a nom de plume. Uh, but the point in both books is that getting better at one thing uh, improves your quality of life. Uh, in Shibumi, uh, for example, they have a character who, uh, uh, while he is uh, uh, dying, writes a note to uh, a, a close friend of his in which he uh, talks extensively about uh, uh, the amount of ta saffron which was in the uh, the last meal that he cooked. Uh, and it goes into great detail. And it's kind of like saying, this is the way I want to be remembered uh, for my expertise in cooking. Uh, so I guess that uh, uh, from my point of view anyway, uh, quality is something that one searches for uh, in one's life to define expertise. Mm. I want to shift a little bit, though, and actually uh, bring it in in terms of um, suffering, if we will, human suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and, and particularly as it relates to drug abuse, because this was sort of where I was having a little difficulty with this. Uh, addiction uh, being an example. And, and yet that as I more and more think about it, it, it makes perfect sense in that if you are suffering, which is the human condition, that it stands to reason that you would seek out an alternative substance to try to relieve that suffering 
because quality of life is the only variable that matters. And so here you're trying to improve the quality of your life by reducing suffering, um, and that might explain addiction. Well, uh, certainly if one is addicted to a particular substance, uh, you're, uh, when you take that substance, you will feel better, at least for the moment. Although if you talk to people who have been addicts for a long period of time, uh, after a while, the substance is just moving them towards some level of, uh, uh, of functioning, of normal functioning in their, in their world. Uh, but again, the, uh, the way I define an addict is somebody who can't follow his own rules. Mm. If you're taking a substance on a regular basis as prescribed or even as not prescribed, but you take it at the same time every day in the same quantity, and uh, it helps you to get in a state of mind which improves the previous state of mind you were in, uh, then you only have to deal with the, uh, the effects of the drug on you. I'm assuming it's a drug. Uh, and uh, the simple reality is that uh, all drugs uh, have effects. Mm -hmm. The ones you don't like are what they call the side effects. Uh, but if I'm taking speed because I want to stay up all night, it's a side effect that I don't eat and I run off at the mouth. Uh, if I'm taking speed because I, uh, 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 I, I have another purpose, you know, such as uh, uh, staying awake or, uh, or, uh, or being able to talk or being able to take a test or something of that sort, and the other factors are the side effects. And the reality is a drug is a drug. It has effects. And uh, there are always side effects. There are always some effects that you don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to addiction, I think the, uh, the reality is that you can be addicted to, to any number of substances, whether legal or illegal. And uh, uh, it doesn't much matter if you're taking it in a way which helps improve your quality of life at the moment and in the long run. If you're taking it in a way that helps you improve your quality of life in the moment, but has a long-term negative effect on you, uh, or you're not taking it as, uh, uh, as you yourself believe you should take it in a, uh, in a controlled way, um, uh, then you're, uh, you're playing in a uh, ballpark which uh, has a set of rules that you're really not setting. For me, it, it, it came home and it, and it was brought home to me with uh, uh, a recent overdose death of a very high profile individual here uh, recently, which is being kept quiet. And as I, again, try to understand how this individual could get to that point, when they apparently had everything going for them. They had the looks, they, they, they had the talent, the income. Um, it, it's still, it, it, this, this topic, quality of life is the only variable that matters, really opened up a whole new way to look at uh, the self-medication this individual tried to undertake as a way to I'm sure, just speaking from my own, you know, uh, experience when, you know, I, I would have used pot, um, that it was to get into an altered state of consciousness to reduce suffering and improve a, a, a quality of life. And yet, certainly from my own experience, it became a monkey on my back at some point, and I'm sure for this individual, it did as well. But perhaps that, that point that we're making here, the quality of life is the only variable that matters, might offer some insight to those who are suffering from the loss of this individual. Well, there are several factors in what you just brought up. Uh, let's sort of take them one at a time. Referring to our past uh, discussions, I would say that, uh, that what we don't know is what was the inner world of that individual like. Uh, and uh, if that individual were consulting me, that's what I would spend my time on. I've spent a lot of time with, uh, uh, with quite a few famous people. I guess Woodstock is a place where uh, uh, stars 
uh, wind up coming for a short period of time. At any rate, uh, for a while, I think I was uh, identified as the uh, the shrink to see if you come to Woodstock. Mm. Uh, at any rate, uh, getting inside the minds of people who are famous or rich or uh, seem to be uh, seem to have everything that everybody would want uh, winds up turning up some. Uh, uh, not so pleasant things. As I look back on it, I'm not sure I would trade places with any of them. Uh, the, uh, the thing that I have to deal with is the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, their stardom or their fame or their... Uh, uh, or their uh, Even their wealth. Yeah, pardon? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've talked to... Uh, uh, to uh, people who, uh, whose names you would recognize, who have been, uh, uh, you know, cover cover women or something of that sort, uh, and uh, it's distracting to me. Uh, you know, I remember one woman uh, uh, who anybody would consider a ten on a scale of ten. Uh, when she smiled, I lost my train of thought, and I have to, you know, look away. And I remember saying to myself, "Gee, I." Uh, uh, I have to not look directly at her or, uh, or I won't be able to figure out what her problems are. Uh, it's an extremely uh, tricky business figuring out what goes on inside someone's mind. Uh, but the name of the game is, from my point of view, uh, understanding uh, that there could always be uh, what I call a Richard Corey aspect to it. I don't know whether you're familiar with that poem, but it's a poem about a man who is very rich and very famous and everybody admires him. And uh, I think the last line is, then one day Richard Corey went home and put a bullet through his head. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, speaks to uh, what we are putting on individuals from our own point of view uh, as to maybe what we're lacking or what we uh, imagine they must be living uh, in their own life if they have looks, wealth, intellect, talent, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, uh, as I've explored your tweets, one of the things that um, you know struck me was that uh, even rich people uh, suffer, you know, lack a, a, of sense of self. Or can't remember what the tweet was, but I'm sure we'll get to it in a future podcast. But um, wealth is no guarantor of success or of happiness. Good looks, neither talent, either. And and I think again. Certainly, as I, you know, explore this and, and through our work together, the one constant is that life is suffering. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly that's a, a Buddhist principle. And uh, uh, I never thought of myself as a Buddhist, but uh, uh, when my daughter was asked to uh, describe my spirituality uh, uh, by the, uh, uh, the minister at our church, uh, she said, oh, he's a Buddhist. Uh, <laughs> I think it has to do with the fact that I spend a lot of time meditating, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't change the uh, the reality that, uh, uh, that it's not so much that suffering is a part of life as the way we look at it, the attitude that we have toward it. Uh, there's no way to get through life without suffering, uh, mm -hmm. but if you have a way of, uh, of approaching uh, it's a way of finding the best way to look at the particular experience that you're having at the moment, then at least you can say, hey, I am doing the best I can, uh, which uh, uh, you know, both of these uh, subjects are referring to previous uh, podcasts that we've yeah. done. Which I love, which again, it, you know, it all is very circular and all interconnected here. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, uh, as you know, try to simplify things as much as possible. And I consider quality of life as being dependent on two variables. Mm. Uh, the two variables I call cocktail and attitude. Mm. Uh, cocktail refers to everything you do with your body and put into your body. Which uh, is really one of the hardest things to control. And yet, uh, if one does get control of it, uh, you know you are doing everything that is right for you and to maintain your, your health uh, and your functioning, both mental and physical. So the cocktail 
includes the medications you're taking, includes the food you're putting in your body, right. the exercise you're doing, it includes uh, the uh, uh, the ADLs that you have, all the activities of daily living that you engage in. And the more consistent those are, uh, usually the higher the quality of your life. Mm. Uh, and attitude is the thing, of course, that I spend most of my time on, which is basically getting your head in the right place to deal with whatever you have to deal with. Mm. And that includes understanding that all there is is now, but also understanding that if you're in touch with your soul, the past and the future come together in the now, and you have a good sense of what your soul would want you to do at this moment in time. Mm. And when you were talking about addictions, uh, the obvious problem with being addicted to substances that make you feel better in the short run uh, is that in the long run, they have a price tag. Yeah, yeah. You know, speaking, you know, just on a personal level here, over the holiday weekend, you know, I went into the tunnel of darkness, uh, which you and I have talked about. Um, and that even though I'm doing the best that I feel that I can, there are times that I will go into the tunnel of darkness. Um, okay. I'm fortunate were, enough to know that it... Yeah, when you were in that tunnel, were you aware of the fact that it was not a permanent state? Well, and so that was the benefit, is that I, I was familiar enough with it and through our work together that I recognized that I was in the tunnel of darkness uh -huh. and it only lasted for about a half a day and a, and a night. And the next morning uh, I was out of the tunnel of darkness. And I, I'm so fortunate because the work that we have done for so long uh, is that you're in my brain. Um, and so w what uh, came up for me with the recognition that I was in the tunnel of darkness was a phrase that you've used many times with me and here on this uh, podcast as well, is that what can I do right now to make me feel better? Um, and hopefully to not have it be uh, an addiction uh, that will do it. Um, and, and so that was in my brain, but yet at the same time, I didn't feel like I necessarily could. And so what I did is I went to bed. And yet that was uh, what was able to make me feel better because I uh, was able to go to sleep and, and wake up the next day not in the tunnel of darkness. So uh, that, I just, I, it was a, su a success for me and, and I well, wanted to share it with our audience. But yeah, uh, to complete the sentences, what can I do right now that'll help me feel even just a little bit better about myself without harming others or myself. Wow. Uh, and uh, the, it sounds to me like you came up with the right answer. Yeah. To go to bed. Yeah. And going to bed basically says I'm turning uh, the current moment over to my subconscious. And my subconscious is the part of me that, uh, that solves my problems through dreams, through creating images. Uh, and uh, uh, in my experience, when someone goes to bed, it often does work to help you feel better. Uh, but there is a demarcation uh, at the point where you're spending more than 12 hours a day in bed on a regular basis. Uh, you're moving into a physiological neurovegetative depression. Mm. Uh, and that is something to watch out for. On the other hand, what you did sounds like it was exactly the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, you needed to turn uh, uh, turn yourself over to your subconscious, let your subconscious uh, work through whatever issues needed to be worked through, and you woke up less than 12 hours later and were, and were functional. Yeah, yeah, and was able to get back uh, on the, on the, you know, daily mm -hmm. grind, so to speak, and, and to be um, fulfilled in whatever it was that I was feeling unfulfilled in uh, the and day before. I don't know what it was. Also, mm -hmm. often we can figure it out. In my case, I have to figure it out. Uh, right. In most cases, it's not necessary. In most cases, uh, uh, you have to recognize that there are going to be times when you feel lousy. Uh, uh, that's part of the human condition. And uh, the name of the game is survive it. Uh, make sure you're not on the railroad tracks. Right. Right. And um, I found joy again in things that I hadn't found joy in the day before. 
And, you know, you and I have spoken about this before that, you know, it could even just be astrological and, and whether you believe in that or not, um, you know, that was something that was going through my mind as well, that, Hey, this could just be astrological influences that are, uh, taking me, you know, into the tunnel of darkness. Um, and, and it was that recognition, uh, internally that this is a temporary problem. Um, and to not again think of it as a permanent problem that I needed to solve with an extreme action. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that there are uh, always forces uh, that affect our state of mind uh, that have nothing to do with us or that we can have no control over. And uh, uh, whatever you choose to believe in, uh, if it enables you to uh, uh, to accept the serenity prayer, recognize uh, there's nothing I can do about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and in your case, go to bed. Uh, assume it was astrological or might have been or might not have been. Um, you know, the, part of the problem is that beliefs and science are, are always thought of as being at odds. Mm. In fact, the placebo effect and the nocebo effect are clearly scientific realities. Uh, you know, when it comes to astrology, uh, you talk to a scientist, and uh, and he will say, uh, uh, according to astrology, when the child is born, at the moment that they're born, the very second that they're born, and the influence of the stars on that ch child's birth are a major factor in the rest of that per child's life. Um, uh, but a scientist will say, wait a minute, the gravitational pull of the doctor on the child is greater than the gravitational pull of all the stars and everything else. Right. Uh, I, that's why I use the term scientific. Uh, there are ways of, of thinking that science is so great that it has to be believed no matter what. Mm. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that, uh, that belief by itself is a major force that controls uh, our uh, state of being. Mm. And, and this comes back to, you know, the thought of predestination and is there in fact free will, uh, which are you know intertwined with all religions, Buddhism uh, as well being being one of them. Yeah. yeah, I used to get into an argument with my psychiatrist about free will, and uh, uh, of course, there's no way to prove or disprove it. Uh, so it's basically a philosophical and intellectual argument. Uh, yeah, my feeling is uh, uh, I'd rather assume that there's free will. Uh, because uh, it gives me options, and I consider mental health to be directly proportional to the number of options you have. Mm, wonderful. We're speaking with uh, Dr. Neil Marinello. He's a behavior expert and solutions-focused life coach out of Woodstock, Vermont, continuing our podcast series discussing good mental health. Our topic on today's discussion is quality of life is the only variable that matters. Neil, share some more about that, uh, that uh, theorem, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, uh, the key uh, variable here is attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, in any situation, there is a right state of mind. There is a right way to think about it. No matter how dire the situation is, no matter how bad it is, there's a, a way of getting your head in the right place to deal with it. And uh, that's what I seek. Uh, I'll never always, uh, get, you know, I'll never be able to get there in every situation, uh, but I think I'm better at it now than I used to be, and uh, hopefully I'll be better at it uh, in the future than I am now. Uh, and that is the definition of professional. That is the definition of quality of life. From my point of view, it's just working on something uh, that you're never going to be perfect at, uh, but you're improving. Uh, the concept of better is a very essential one from my perspective. Uh, uh, my job is to help people uh, get into a better state of mind to deal with whatever it is they have to deal with. And uh, what they have in me, uh, hopefully, is uh, somebody who has explored so many different states of mind that it's fairly easy for me to touch on what's the right way to think about this? What's the right way to think about your situation right now? Wonderful. And I can, you know, again, attest to that success. And, you know, I want to just offer this out to anyone who is watching. If you or someone you know is uh, suffering through their human condition, whether it be through addiction or uh, what self-image issues, 
uh, or they're uh, concerned about a loved one who may be going through something like this, uh, someone like Dr. Neil Marinello is available and is usually just a phone call away. Uh, and, and Neil, just speak uh, to, to that and your availability uh, if someone were to give you a call. Uh, well, my basic uh, uh, intent is to be available from the time I get up in the morning until the time I go to bed at night, which is 3.30 a.m. to 8 o'clock at night. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, my cell phone uh, is with... Uh, AT&T, and sometimes calls don't get through to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, what I say to my clients is, if you call me and I don't get back to you within an hour, uh, something's wrong. So please call again or text me or something of that sort so that I can be aware of that. But the bottom line on it is that from my perspective, uh, the most important thing uh, for uh, a shrink is to be available to his clients. Uh, people don't think in terms of, uh, okay, I'm having a problem right now, but my next appointment with the doctor uh, is next Thursday, so I'll hold on to that problem until then. Uh, I would rather uh, that I get the call at the time that the problem is experienced, and uh, then there's a chance to, to deal with it at the moment. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's a matter of recreating the situation that may or may not exist uh, later on. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems with, uh, with being a shrink is that uh, it's, it tends to be set up in, in favor of the doctor. Uh, uh, shrinks operate in terms of, uh, uh, of slots. Right. Uh, so uh, I have a, uh, a 10 o'clock slot on Tuesday. Uh, and uh, I've just terminated with that, uh, with that client. So uh, if you'd like that slot, it's available. If not, I'll go to the next person on my waiting list, which has been sitting there for six months. Um, I believe in being available to a person at the time they need me in whatever way I can. Uh, unfortunately, uh, AT&T doesn't seem to agree with me all the time. I also think it's really important to recognize um, that, you know, Again, if life is suffering, quite often in, in the course of our lives, we'll need someone such as yourself uh, to help us return to right thinking and to help us process a life event. And yet there can be a stigma attached with uh, seeking uh, mental health counseling. Um, that's, that's one reason why I, I prefer my current title, which is coach. Right. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, as we've explored in the past, I, I'm, I'm no better than anybody else. I just happen to be good at, at one or two things, and uh, I make that skill set available to uh, anybody that that, uh, that chooses to take advantage of it. Uh, but you're right. There is a stigma attached to, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the concept being that uh, whatever problems you have, you should deal with them yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, not only not always possible, but uh, you don't always have the uh, uh, the available tools to deal with them yourself. Uh, and, uh, one of the things I tell my clients is, uh, if I know somebody else that can do a better job of t dealing with your problem, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no desire to uh, extend the amount of time I spend talking to anybody. And if someone wants to talk to me, uh, that's great. But if, uh, uh, but I don't want to talk to anybody that doesn't want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's important to note that uh, you started out uh, talking about uh, your role in a sense being a professional friend or the good daddy. Um, and, and it's an important concept really to kind of explore a little bit because if you're having this issue, speaking to a very good friend, um, you know, maybe make you vulnerable because you don't want to reveal something about yourself to this friend or to a family member. And both of those uh, individuals may have a vested interest in a particular outcome or may be clouded in their viewpoint of you and of your situation so that that, in a sense, may not uh, help improve the quality uh, of your life. Whereas you being a, a, a disinterested neutral party, so to speak, who is you know, whose main objective is to help improve 
the quality of your life. Uh, that, that's an important distinction, I think, uh, in your life coach uh, uh, client relationship. Yes, yes. Even a person uh, who loves you and wants what's best for you uh, has to deal with the fact that uh, uh, what they think is best for you may be uh, obfuscated by what they think is best for them mm -hmm. uh, or by their love for you, which uh, uh, always involves a certain amount of projection. Uh, now, I'm as much of, a, uh, of an open book as I can be. I tell people what I'm about and uh, what my experiences are and let them decide from that how, whether it applies to them or not. Uh, but there is nothing that I say to anybody that isn't meant to help them. Uh, when people consult me uh, and assume that, uh, that I'm some sort of a, uh, uh, of a judgmental bad daddy, uh, they just don't get me. And uh, unfortunately, that can lead to uh, a lot of testing. And at my age, I'm getting a little sick of being tested. I just soon talk to the people who, uh, who know that I'm coming out of a place where uh, I want to help them. And if I don't, I'm going to feel bad. And uh, again, another component of your relationship, which I think is really important to mention uh, with any uh, client that you take on, uh, or, or counsel with, or, or coach, rather, is the confidentiality aspect of it. Mm -hmm. well, confidentiality is a very interesting concept, and I do my best to observe it uh, in every way possible. But as we talked about in the rules thing, there are circumstances in which confidentiality and the respect of confidentiality uh, is likely to hurt people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't break confidentiality easily, but I have broken it. Uh, a, uh, there is a thing called HIPAA, uh, the Health Information uh, Patient Privacy Act, uh, which is a, uh, generally a very good rule and in which all uh, uh, doctors and mental health people and, uh, and other medical professionals uh, have to follow. Uh, uh, but there was a time when... Uh, uh, when uh, my uh, older son went into a hospital and uh, because he was over 21, I couldn't find out where he was uh, because of HIPAA. And uh, the doctor uh, would have gotten in trouble if he had told me where my son was. Uh, the, uh, I use HIPAA acceptable uh, releases uh, uh, nearly all the time. In other words, if I have a client, I have them sign they want me to talk to somebody uh, who's a relative or, or, uh, or another doctor. I have them sign a form uh, that gives very specific instructions for what I can talk to them about and what I can. On the other hand, if uh, I think somebody's going to wind up getting hurt uh, in, a, uh, in a serious physical way as a result of, uh, uh, of my, you know, keeping my mouth shut, I'm not going to keep my mouth shut. Mm. It's so interesting as you're sharing this, I, I see the context of our next discussion, which is one of your favorite topics, that all human systems are flawed. That will be the topic of our next discussion with Dr. Uh, Marinello. And what you've just spoken about right here is encapsulated perfectly that here is a system that is meant for confidentiality and to protect uh, both parties, in essence, and yet at the same time, we can see how, in in fact, it, it can go against uh, someone's uh, best interest. Yeah, that's correct, yes. And, uh, uh, and any uh, communication uh, can be used for good or for not so good. Uh, any, uh, any communication can be used as a weapon as well as, as a, uh, a beneficial uh, method of, uh, of helping people. And uh, that judgment has to be made, uh, hopefully by someone in, a, in a, uh, as objective a way as possible, uh, and by somebody applying the serenity prayer uh, as much as possible. Uh, the truth is that, uh, that I absolutely hate having to break rules, uh, but that doesn't mean that I won't do it. Mm. We're discussing uh, good mental health with Dr. Neil Marinello. You can find him and follow him on Twitter at Coach Dr. Neil. Our topic for today's discussion is 
quality of life is the only variable that matters. Neil, why don't you wrap up for us and give us some final thoughts on the idea behind this statement? Well, I believe that, uh, that quality of life depends more on how you think about things than anything else. And I believe there is a way of thinking about any situation, no matter how dire, no matter how bad it seems, uh, that at least gives you the satisfaction of knowing you're in the right state of mind about it. Uh, when, uh, when you have that thought to yourself, I'm doing the best I can, I'm in the right state of mind to deal with this situation, and, uh, and all I need to do at this point is blah, blah, blah. And whatever that blah 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 is, uh, you do it. Uh, then uh, you're uh, observing uh, this principle that you're maximizing the quality of your life regardless of the circumstances that you have no control over. We invite you to join us for our next discussion, which again, the topic will be all human systems are flawed. On behalf of our good doctor, I'm Matt Kelly. We're both wishing you good mental health.